All right, everyone, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> we're continuing with baptism and the theme of it, obviously, and we're also going to continue with leprosy um, because there is more things in the Torah regarding this topic. Um, there's a bit more that the stuff we're going to cover regarding leprosy today has a bit more of a body dynamics feel to it. And hopefully you'll see that as we go through it. But we'll go through it. Before we do that, however, let's very quickly recap what we covered last week. And hopefully even just from last week's teaching, you're beginning to realise that there's a lot more to this idea of baptism as to what most people have been led to believe, that there's actually far more riches and depths to this topic than what is generally taught out there. Uh, and more specifically, how it's actually right throughout the Torah. And we're going to start seeing a bit more of it in the prophets today. Because uh, again... Baptism seems to be well established by the time of the first century. Where did they get these ideas from? So we looked at leprosy and we saw that it seemed to have had a spiritual root and that with this idea was what has been concealed shall be revealed. We know Yeshua uses this phrase and I believe is really pointing to the judgment of the believers. Uh, but again, we see... Uh, you know, with Miriam and Aaron, this whole thing, and with uh, Isaiah, King Isaiah, pride seems to have been at the root. That's the common denominator in both of these accounts. Uh, and you could argue that Naaman as well had this pride issue because he was a great man. Pride is at the root of Miriam and King Isaiah being struck with leprosy. Um, and again, we made the point that when you, when, you were, when you were a leper, you would go to the priest, not to a doctor, which again implies that this is something spiritual in nature occurring in the physical realm. Um, we asked the question, is the ceremony of the cleansing of the leper a type and shadow of the plan of redemption from an eternal perspective? I believe the answer to that is 101% yes, um, and I think it gives you actually quite a lot in that type and shadow. We saw there were parallels between the cleansing of the leper and the Yom Kippur ceremony. Namely, that in stage one of cleansing of the leper, there were the two birds, one was killed, one was set free. This paralleling the goats, one had its hands laid on and took the sin of Israel upon it and sent out to the desert, the other one was slain for the cleansing of the tabernacle and all the vessels within it. But there's also this link with the blood being brought in and sprinkled seven times. And you, when, when you actually cross-reference this idea of sprinkling seven times, it's, it appears in quite a few places, which we'll get to throughout the series. Stage one of the ceremony, so remember that the cleansing of the leper was a two-stage process. There was stage one, the leprosy seems to have gone, and that's where you had the two birds. Uh, but this is where the washing of the clothes and the body would come in. And we saw these two Hebrew words, kavas for the washing of clothes, which is, means to tread, actually, to trample on. So, you know, think deep clean. And the word rachatz for the cleaning of the body. And this implies a full submersion. And if I'm not mistaken, it's also the word used for the priests cleansing themselves at the laver, which is going to be important when we get to that part in the series. Once you've gone through stage one of the ceremony, there was, um, it said you were allowed back into the camp, but you weren't allowed back into your own house. And so the stage two, to be able to restore you back to your house, was actually predicated on a guilt offering of a one-year-old male lamb. And this had echoes, obviously, to the Pesach lamb. It's the same uh, prerequisites for both of these offering a, a lamb a male uh, a male lamb a year old without blemish you, and again these are huge messianic illusions here where the ritual poor the guilt offering remains the same 
So at stage two of the ceremony, if you were average wealth or well-to-do, you had to bring three uh, sheep. If you were poor, however, you would bring one sheep and two birds. But the guilt offering, which was this one-year-old lamb, remained the same. And again, think of the messianic illusion that the restoration of mankind, the price is the same, whether rich or poor. This also parallels the uh, the half shekel, uh, the, the atonement of the firstborns here. It's the price was the same, whether rich or poor. Isaiah 53 makes it very clear that Messiah will make himself an asham, a guilt offering, um, and that he would take upon himself the transgressions of his people. Um, and again, you see echoes of this with the two birds. One is killed, one is set free. The two goats, one is killed, one is set free. But even the one that's set free, all the sin of the congregation is placed upon it. Uh, so there's this idea of substitution. And this is what the sacrificial system, a big part of it, is what it pointed to. Isaiah 53 also says Messiah was stricken. And there's a Hebrew word play there with the word nagar. It can mean to have a, a blow dealt. Uh, it can mean to touch. It can also mean to be struck with leprosy. And this is where Judah came up with the idea of the quote-unquote leper Messiah. Messiah cleansed lepers by touching them. Again, like we see this in the Gospels, and I believe that there would have been a Hebrew interplay here on the word nagar, that the one that would cleanse Israel of its leprosy would nagar the leper. Like there's this beautiful wordplay going on there. Naaman had his leprosy recovered from him. The Hebrew word there, asaf, and it literally means to gather, to have his leprosy, leprosy gathered from him. And it's used in harvest terms. But again, I believe this is this illusion that Messiah would take something upon himself i.e. our spiritual leprosy, the thing that causes us to be cast out. Because right now, we're not in Elohim's presence. We've been cast out. The story of Naaman, I believe, lays a foundation for the baptism unto repentance. It says that his flesh will be restored. But the word there for restored is shuv. It will be turned, which is the root word of teshuvah, which is repentance, this turning to. So right there, you know, this Naaman dipping himself, immersing himself seven times. Again, think of the leprosy, the sprinkling seven times. And this thing of the flesh turning or being restored. It's spelling out repentance. Naaman dipped himself in the river or the living waters seven times. Uh, the word there in Hebrew was taval, uh, and taval can mean to dip oneself, but it can also mean to dip the finger into something, or to dip something into something. This word taval, we looked at where it's used in scripture, dipping the hyssop in the blood of the Pesach. So again, leprosy tied to the Passover. The priest dipping his finger in blood and sprinkling it seven times before Yah when the congregational priest sinned unintentionally. So this was a separate area in the Torah. But again, there's these little links. And when you see little echoes, I believe the father's trying to point something out. There's always a little gem to uncover. The live bird, the cedar wood, the scarlet and the hyssop being dipped in the blood of the dead bird over the living waters. And I believe that that is a typology of the crucifixion there. You have all the ingredients. You have something dying. You have woods. You have scarlet representing blood. You, this is crucifixion overtones there. And that it's that blood and living water that is partaking of the cleansing. It was used in the priest dipping his finger in the oil and sprinkling it seven times before Yah, before putting it on top of the blood of the guilt offering. And this is a bit that people miss. First, the, the blood of the guilt offering was put on the right ear, the right thumb and the right big toe. Then oil 
was put on that. Uh, a brother earlier, uh, I wish I'd put this in the teaching, but he noticed uh, that how much oil was used. It will say a log of oil. Uh, how much was it to the letter again? 300, 380 mils. Now you've got to think, was it three litres? Yeah. You have a measure of all. The priest could only carry so much in his left hand. So try taking a palm full out of a big... And it says that the rest was poured on top of the leper. He would have been drenched, essentially, with oil. And we lose these little things when we don't understand the measures. The Hebrew word taval, we also saw it's the equivalent of bapto and baptizo in the Greek, which is where we get our English word baptism or to baptize. John, Yohanan, the baptizer, he immersed in water, but he also says that Messiah will immerse in the spirit and fire. Uh, we'll dive a bit more into this in a part or two down the series. But I believe that this is a parallel to the blood of the lamb on the right ear, thumb and big toe, and then the oil being put on top. Uh, we're going to see that there is uh, a link between water and spirit today a bit more clearly. Um, everyone remember that? <laughs> sort of, sort of. Right, let's dive into today. When a garment has an infection of leprosy in it, the word there is nega. Like, so remember the, the verb nagar, to touch, to strike a blow. This is the infection or the blow itself. When it has an infection of leprosy in it, in a woolen garment or a linen garment. Again, now think, what do garments represent? Okay, your actions, your deeds. Or in the warp or in the weft of the linen or wool, or in leather or in any leather work. The word for leather, or, means skin. So by implication, it's hide leather. I mean, it's the skin of that, of, wait, it, do, it doesn't have to be an animal. In Genesis uh, 3, when it says that Yah clothed them with garments of skin, this is the word being used. So think, what are you covered in? Are you covered in leather? Or are you covered in skin? So again, we're going to see, bear in the back of your mind, yeah, you don't want leather made out of you, but <laughs> this is going to have body dynamics overtones, huge body dynamic overtones. And the infection shall be greenish or reddish in the garment or in the leather or in the warp or in the weft or in any leather object. Now here it says kli or, so it means a vessel of skin. So yours truly are vessels of skin. Your skin bottles is another way of putting it that scripture puts it that way. <laughs> so think of if you have leprosy in you. Okay, now we made the point in part one, we are all spiritual lepers. Hopefully we're being cleansed. It is an infection of leprosy and shall be shown to the priest. Again, so you went to the priest for this. The priest shall look at the infection, so he inspects it, and he shall shut up the infected seven days. It's put in quarantine. Again, I believe this is a huge typology of the 7,000 years that we're in. We're quarantined away from Elohim. Why? There's an infection going on. An STD, a spiritually transmitted disease. He shall look at the infection on the seventh day. And when the infection has spread in the garment or in the warp or in the weft or in the leather or any leather work, the infection is an active leprosy. It is unclean. He shall burn that garment or the warp or the weft in the wool or linen or any other, any think skin vessel, vessel of skin. Leather object here is vessel of skin in which the infection is, for it is an active leprosy, it is burnt with fire. Where do the wicked go? The lake of fire. 
Like, again, this is a typology of the great judgment of Elohim here. So this spiritual leprosy, this uncleanness. But if the priest looks and sees that the infection has not spread in the garment, or in the warp, or in the weft, or in any leather object, then the priest shall give command, and they shall wash that in which the infection is, and they shall shut it up another seven days. So think of what the water represents. We know Paul says that husbands and wives, you know, he says that they're to die for their wives as Messiah died for the assembly so that she can experience the washing by the water of the word. We're also going to see today this link between the water and the spirit. Okay, so, and remember that Yeshua said that his words are spirit and are life. Water gives life, the spirit gives life, his words give life. There's all these things. So think within a fellowship dynamic setting that um, you have this idea of putting someone out that Paul goes on about. And then you, what they want to see, so here they're quarantining it and they want to see, is it going to spread? Is it going to spread? Now let's say it hasn't spread it's still not declared clean yet. They want to see what's going on. And time seems to be the thing that is the, is the litmus test. The priest shall look at the infection after it has been washed and see, this is critical here, if the infection has not changed its appearance, through, though the infection has not spread, it is unclean and burn it with fire. It is eaten away in its inside or outside. So let's say you had a blotch on it and you shut it, you wash it, think water, word, spirit, accountability, discipleship. You come back to it seven days later and if it's exactly the same, you burn the whole lot with fire. It's unclean. Think of the implication that it doesn't matter what you've done, you've tried everything, it's still the same. It's still acting the same way. You know, I, I'll be open with you guys, but like, you know, sometimes people, when, when discipline is dished out, people go, oh, that's really harsh. That's really harsh. And I look back at, over the years and I think the Torah is harsher than what I've been. Do you know what I mean? The Torah is very cutthroat on this. I think, anyway, if... The priest shall look and see that the infection has faded after washing it. Then he shall tear it out the garment or out of the warp or the weft or out of the leather. So even if the infection is starting to shrink, you tear that bit out and we'll see what happens. Well, that bit would have been burnt with fire. If it is still seen in the garment or in the warp or in the weft or in any vessel of skin... It is a spreading infection. Burn it with fire, that which the infection is. So this is, you've got that blotch. The blotch has faded, but it's not gone away. You still tear it out and you burn it with fire. Now, what does Paul say to do with someone that's causing dissension in the body? You remove them, what for? So that the adversary for the destruction of the flesh, right? So they can be sifted by the adversary. There's your cleansing with fire. Tribulation. This is body dynamics all over it. This is also, think, 7,000 year plan of redemption. Messiah is not going to allow something with a leprous infection in it in the seventh day, because this is on the seventh day that it's been looked at and inspected. So think the judgment seat of Messiah, but if you want to go beyond that, if you really want to go bird's eye, think that the millennial reign will be the real test of what makes it into eternity or not. I mean, this is it's the ultimate testing ground. It's the ultimate inspection of leprosy. And if you wash the garment or in the warp or in the weft or any leather object, if the infection has disappeared from it, then it shall be washed a second time and shall be clean. So the only time that a garment can be saved is if you tear out the infection in it or the infection goes away after washing 
twice, uh, once, sorry. It's, once it's washed a second time, it's clean. But that's after a, round of, a couple of rounds of inspection. And so I'm reading this, I'm like, man, this is not me, this is Taurus saying that. And it's made me think, sometimes in the past, I may have allowed things to play out too long by Torah. But it's, can people see that? This is the Torah, or the law, of the infection of leprosy in a garment of wool or linen, or in the warp, or in the weft, or in any leather object, or vessel of skin, to pronounce it clean, or to pronounce it unclean. So, it's a, you know, as Paul would say, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump. Like, even if the infection had faded, but was still visible, you tore it out. You tore it out because eventually, do you, you got to remember that back then, uh, garments were actually a form of currency because they didn't have sweatshops, you know, and child labor to make your Primark clothes and stuff like that. They had to spin the yarn themselves and you, they had to find the, the, the materials for the cloth. It was very labor intensive to actually make a garment. So do you sacrifice a whole cloak or do you just tear a little chunk out of it and then put a new patch of cloth, which then brings up the parable of the shrunk and the unshrunk cloth. But we're not going to cover that today. Proverbs 26, verse 20. For lack of wood, a fire goes out and without a slanderer, strife ceases. <laughs> I believe this is literally laws of leprosy telling you right there. As charcoal is to a burning coals and wood to a fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a slanderer are as dainty morsels which go down to the inner parts of the heart. And so to draw the parallel back to the um, leprosy of the garment, it's said that if you, okay, you wash the garment, okay, you wash it, you wait for seven days, the leprosy has shrunk. You tear out that bit of leprosy, you burn that, but then you, you inspect what's left of the garment another seven days. And if it's leprous again, you have to burn the whole thing. There will be times where, going back to body dynamics, that this is the danger you, you, you risk when not dealing with a leprosy in terms of body dynamics quick enough. You remove the person too late, but they've sown their Lashon Hurrah. And the Lashon Hurrah remains, and it's infected everybody else around them. And so this is what this is speaking of. Like, this is telling you how it works, Proverbs. The Torah is just telling you how to deal with it. So that's leprosy of the garment. Uh, before we move on to the next bit, remember that, like I said, our garments are what clothe us. Job says that his righteous deeds clothed him. We can have clothes of salvation or clothes of Yeshua, Messiah. So it's what, what you do is um, what's visible unto others. And just this tiny little bit can infect what you do. This is why it's critical to get rid of the leaven. Like I've seen people act some weird and wonderful ways because of an infection that's inside them. And the parallel I want to draw to is Ecclesiastes. Dead flies make the perfumer's oil stink. Just small, tiny, little, inconspicuous things can defile a whole product. You know, so this is why... We as fallen creatures have to adhere to Yah's commands. Why we have to adhere to the instructions, especially left to us by the apostles, because they're there to protect us from ourselves and our fallen nature. Like we always like to think, and I think it comes from this sense of pride that, oh yeah, well we know that, that won't happen to us. None of us are exempt, none of us, because we're all in this fallen state. I think all of us will have had this moment in our lives, probably several times, where you catch yourself going a certain way and you catch yourself and you think, oh my goodness, I never thought this would happen to me, but it did. 
like our flesh blindsides us so much, our fallen state. And so when, you know, just keep to the, if, if, you stay, if you stay within the confines of his commandments and the instructions, you're safe. Like if you operate within that sphere, nothing can touch you technically because you're under his protection. It's when we step out of that hedge of protection that we get problems. And this is why accountability is so important because we can delude ourselves. Leviticus 14, let's deal with the leprosy of the house. Now, what's the spiritual application of the house? What is the house, spiritually speaking? It's us, spiritually. I should have probably started with that verse, but when we go through this, understand that we are the house of Elohim, being built in the spirit. Uh, once we get through Leviticus that section of Leviticus 14, I'll show you two verses that make that point. So we are the house and we are, you're the individual stones and I'm part, I'm just one stone within the greater house of the people. Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon saying, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as a possession, and I put a plague of leprosy in a house in the land of your possession. Notice who's putting the plague there. It's Yah that's putting the plague there. Well, what's the spiritual significance of that? <clears throat> Who allows false prophets to come in among us? Yah does. He allows it to test his people. Go read Deuteronomy 13. I allow the, like, I'm paraphrasing, but he's allowing us to see who we will serve. Are we going to choose Yah or are we going to choose to have our ears tickled. So Yah allows these things. It's like, again, think of the sifting ground of this time domain. Then shall the one who owns the house come and inform the priest saying, it seems to me that there is a plague in the house. Uh, <laughs> that verse really tickles me and it actually says that in the Hebrew. Like, can you imagine? It seems like <laughs> either there is or isn't. <laughs> You can all, like, what makes me tickle is that you almost get the sense of denial in there. You know when someone, oh, well, then maybe they're not being, and they're actually kidding themselves. It's like, no, this is full blame. You, you know, you see the meme of the dog in the burning house, and it's like, everything's fine. That's what that reminds me of. That's why it tickles me so much. The priest shall command and shall empty the house. And so pull everything out before the priest goes in to look at the plague so that all that is in the house is not made unclean. And after that, the priest goes in to look at the house. So again, I, I love this because religion will have taught you that the leadership and the things are untouchable and they're not to go into the midst of these things. It's like, no, they're to go into it. They're the ones, you know, they're the front line, not the back line. And he shall look at the plague and see if the plague is on the walls of the house with sunken places, greenish or reddish, which appear to be deep in the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. So again, quarantine the whole house. Here we are, quarantined in the times of Maine. The priest shall come in on the seventh day and look and see if the plague has spread on the walls of the house. Then the priest shall command... And they shall remove the stones with the plague in them and shall throw them outside the city into an unclean place. Same, body dynamics. We as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. Let us not be the leprous stones. But notice that it's servant leadership that's to inspect it. while the house is to be scraped inside. All around and the dust that they scrape off, they shall pour into an unclean place outside the city. What do you think they're scraping off? Plaster, yes. Or, what else is that known by? Someone said it, whitewashing. Whitewash. Strip it back to the bare bones. 
Think of the, uh, again, of the body dynamics thing. I mean, look, the reason it stands out to me is because I've had to deal with this. You go into a situation, you're dealing with someone, and it's like, guys or gals or whatever, enough of your religion, enough of your excuses, enough of the leaven, enough of the, like, just strip it all back and get to the heart of it. It's all about the heart. It's all about what's under the surface. I, I don't care how pretty the outside looks. If the house is rotten to the timber, to the supporting pillars, well, good luck, because if you just plaster that all back up, it will just keep coming back and back and back. They shall take the other stones out and put them in the place of those stones and take the other mortar and plaster the house. So you re, you've got to retry and put it back into order. If the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after the, he has removed the stones, after he has scraped the house and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look and see if the plague has spread in the house. It is an act of leprosy in the house. It is unclean. They removed the contagion, but it was too late. Like with the leprosy of the cloth, even though the leprosy had shrunk and they tore that out, the rest of the garment had been infected. And I've seen this within an assembly level. He shall break down the house, its stones and its timber and all the plaster of the house and he shall bring them outside the city to an unclean place. Who judges the house of Israel? Elohim. A divided house shall not stand as well. Like think of all these verses and passages that are being alluded here. There's a really interesting passage in the book of Ezekiel that he, it, it's Yah basically pronouncing judgment upon the house of Israel. And, you know, he, it, I'm going to paraphrase this, but it says, to those that say, coat it with whitewash, coat it with whitewash, Elohim says, I'm going to tear down the whitewash and I'm going to expose it to the foundation. Not only that, I'm going to tear down the whole wall and I'm going to expose it right down to the very foundation so everyone can see what it is. Like, and this is what's being spoken of here. And this, I believe it's these laws that Ezekiel is referencing in this particular passage. Unfortunately, when people are, you know, in general assembly levels, because people don't know either what they're looking at or they, they're not equipped enough or wise enough or have the experience to be able to metaphorically scrape off the plaster... They think, oh yeah, it looks great. Looks great. And it's like, and they're not able to dig under the layers. And then they wonder why the, the bad, you know, the, the issues and the problems continue cycling round and round. Or they're too afraid to do this. Because it's difficult doing this, especially when you're thinking living stones. He who goes into the house all the days while it is shut up becomes unclean until evening. Oh boy, the amount of times I've had to say to people, <laughs> people say, oh, I know they've been put out, but can I fellowship with them? There you go. If you want to become unclean with them, how about it? Like I said, the Torah is brutal on this. This is not me. Like, I look back, I look at this and think, man, have I been too soft? He who lies down in the house has to kavas, he has to tread his clothes out, his garments, and he who eats in that house has to wash his garments. Paul says that when you know someone's in this place, don't even eat with them. Why? Lest you become unclean. And he's not talking of Levitical uncleanness. Notice, I know we've, I didn't want this to be too much body dynamics, but notice the remedies here, uh, especially for the, for the garments. It was dip it, baptise it in the water, and if that does not work, burn it. Now think of the practical, the, the spiritual application of this. You have baptism, like... Essentially, you can be baptised and it's not going to deal with your bad behaviour. Is what the Torah is saying, essentially. 
In fact, you can try to water it with the washing of the word and you can operate as best as you can in, by the spirit, the water, in that situation to try and better, and nothing works. Burn it. Hand it over to be sifted. So what's the remedy for the house? We'll get to that. However, if the priest indeed comes in and looks at it and sees that the plague has not spread in the house, after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And to cleanse the house, ah, the ingredients come up again. He shall take two birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. So think the ingredients of the crucifixion there, your wood, your scarlet. Remember that hyssop is used ceremonially to sprinkle. He shall slay one of the birds in an earthen vessel over living waters. Ma'im chayim, not running waters, living waters. And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the live bird and taval them, immerse them, baptize them in the blood of the slain bird and in the ma'im chayim, in the living waters, and shall sprinkle the house seven times. So you, you've got being dipped and in, baptized into living waters, baptized into the blood of the animal that's the substitute. Remember, one gets set free, one takes the fall, so to speak. Do you see? And these are not only for the cleansing of the lepers, but the sprinkling seven times should have allusions to Yom Kippur, which is all about atonement, cleansing, dealing with sin, purging, ransoming, he shall thus cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the living waters and the live bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet and he shall let the live bird loose outside into the open field. Again, an, an, an inference to the Yom Kippur ceremony and shall make atonement for the house, it shall be clean. So for Elohim to atone for his house, there needs to be a sacrifice that seems to involve blood, wood, living waters. When they were checking Messiah to make sure he was dead, what did they do? They speared him, right? What came out? Blood and water. Hmm. Do you think those standing by may have made the connection to being cleansed by leprosy? cleansed of leprosy like where did they where did John the Baptist have the idea this is the lamb to take away the sin of the world where did he get that idea from I can assure you that John was very well versed in his Tanakh Hebrews 3 5 Moshe was indeed trustworthy in all his house as a servant for a witness of what will be spoken later but Messiah as a son over his own house whose house we are if being the biggest word in that sentence if we hold fast the boldness and the boasting of the expectation firm to the end essentially if you endure until the end then you're his house as Hebrews would also say, we're not those that draw back unto destruction. Hopefully we're not. So there's one witness that we are the spiritual house. Second witness, 1 Peter 2. Drawing near to him, a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. It cannot be any clearer. And this is actually temple language here. A house that Elohim would dwell in. A set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. So in the cleansing of the garment, you have baptism, clear baptism. Submerge the whole lot. Cleanse it, then inspect it. And if it's found wanting, burn it. And... If you're lucky, you may be able to rescue some of it. 
Spirit, same with the house, like living waters, the sprinkling by blood, it's all to cleanse leprosy. So hopefully people are seeing where quote-unquote New Testament language starts to make sense. Things like he has cleansed us of our sin. By his blood we are cleansed. It's not that you're washed in the blood, you're sprinkled with the blood and thus you are cleansed or purged. Does that make sense so far? Are people seeing baptism? And are people seeing the messianic illusions? Good, because we've got another place to go to in the Torah. Numbers 19. Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, This is the law of the Torah which Yah has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer, a perfect one, in which there is no blemish and on which a yoke has never come. You shall give it to Eleazar the priest, or Eleazar, and he shall bring it outside the camp and shall slay it before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger. Now, look, this keeps coming up. Sprinkle some of its blood seven times toward the front of the tent of appointment. So now we have an allusion to the cleansing of the leper, the cleansing of the house, and the Yom Kippur ceremony, which is all to do with atonement. The heifer shall be burned before his eyes. He burns its hide and its flesh and its blood and its dung. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop and scarlet and throw them into the midst of the burning of the heifer. So the heifer was burnt outside the camp, right? And the book of Hebrews would say that Messiah had to be slain outside the camp and bear the shame of it. And again, the ingredients here, cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet, it should have overtones of crucifixion. The priest shall then wash, kavas, tread out his garments and shall bathe or lave or immerse himself, rachat, his body in water. And afterward come into the camp, but the priest is unclean until evening. I don't want to get into all the typologies here but even the officiating priest in officiating in the ceremony had to baptize himself he who is burning it washes or treads his garments in water and shall bathe his body in water and is unclean until evening this is let me say this this is how you know that being unclean is not a sin it's what you do or what you did with your Levitical uncleanness. We'll get to this in a second, but people get really freaked out. Oh, I'm unclean, Levitically, and they freak out. And it's like, no, Yah did things in a certain way that it made people unclean, Levitically. But they're not sinning. It's what you did with that Levitical uncleanness that could be sin, whether you brought it to the tabernacle or not. But we'll get to that in a second. A clean man shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and shall place them outside the camp in a clean place and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water for uncleanness. It is for cleansing from sin. Now, bear this in the back of your mind here because what does Hebrews say? The ashes of a heifer and the blood of goats do not or cannot cleanse sin, but what's the caveat there? According to the conscience. Right now, we're dealing with Levitical uncleanness, physical. We're not dealing, we'll get to this. He who gathers up the ashes of the heifer shall wash his garments. So the word they gather, asaf. This is the same word that Naaman had his leprosy recovered from him. It's the same word. So here you, oh, I love the imagery of the priest gathering here. The ashes of the heifer shall wash his garments and is unclean until evening. 
Here's the thing, like, the priest had to do this. And it make, is Yah making them sin? No. But he's trying to teach them a lesson, re- understanding this ritual. It shall be a law forever to the children of Israel and to the stranger who sojourns in their midst. This is what the red heifer was for. So we've just read as to how you get the ashes of a heifer. This is what it's for. He who touches the dead of any human being is unclean for seven days. So again, how long are we in this time domain? Seven days. We're all dead. We're all infected with death. We need cleansing from death. Remember that death entered in because of sin. So we are the spiritual lepers. We are contaminated with death. He is to cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day he is clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day, then on the seventh day he is not clean. This makes me think of Hosea where it says for two days on the third day he will rise us up again. Anyone who touches the dead of a human being and does not cleanse himself defiles the dwelling place of Yah. Here's the problem. Do we have a physical dwelling place of Yah? We don't. We have a spiritual one. That's us, hopefully. But the problem is, is people mix the spiritual and the physical. I've had women literally say in the past, I'm on my monthlies, I can't come to fellowship. And it's like, you're mixing the physical and the spiritual. We're not the physical dwelling place, we're the spiritual one. Which means that what we need to be focused with is spiritual uncleanness. Oh wait, that's what all the leprosy was all about. Anyone who touches the dead of a human being does not cleanse himself, defiles the dwelling place of Yah. That being shall be cut off from Yisrael. He is unclean, for the water of uncleanness was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still upon him. So basically, this is someone that knows they're unclean and doesn't do anything about it. It's actually a form of high-handed sin. So think when you've got someone that knows and won't listen to accountability and reprove and won't undergo the process, they defile the spiritual house. Like Again, huge body dynamic overtones. This is the Torah when a man dies in a tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent are unclean for seven days. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened to it is unclean. Anyone in the open field who touches someone slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a burial site is unclean for seven days. And for the unclean being, they shall take some of the ashes of the heifer burnt for the cleansing from sin. Now here's the thing, like, did the person sin by touching a dead body? No. I actually believe that this is giving you the inference they're being cleansed from death. Because death entered through sin. Look at what they take. Ashes of a heifer. Oh, and living waters shall be put on them in a vessel. So you would take the ashes of a heifer and you would mix them with living waters. This should be screaming Messiah. Screaming. The red heifer is a typology of Messiah cleansing us from death. By his blood we are cleansed so that we can be raised anew. A clean man shall take hyssop and baptise it, tavale, in the water, the living waters, and shall sprinkle it on the tent, on the vessels. So remember in a house there's vessels of honour and dishonour. And on the beings who were in there or on the one who touched a bone, or the slain, or the dead, or a burial site. Now remember, the ashes of the heifer had cedarwood, hyssop, and scarlet in there as well. Crucifixion. And the clean one shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day he shall cleanse himself. And look, again, he shall wash his garments, tread them out, 
and bathe in water, but be baptized, and then he shall be clean in the evening. This is, this is where the idea of baptism and renewing through baptism comes from. It's not Christian, it's Torah. But the man who is unclean and does not cleanse himself, that being shall be cut off from among the assembly because he has defiled the set-apart place of Yah. Water for uncleanness has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. Bear this in the back of your mind when we look at the spiritual application because our Messiah gives us the spiritual application. It shall be a law forever to them. The one who sprinkles the water for uncleanness washes his garments. And the one who touches the water for unclean, uncleanness is unclean until evening. People miss that. The priest officiating in the cleansing of this person became unclean himself. Think of the application like, let's go to the plan of redemption. Messiah had to put on flesh to do what he had to do. Divinity had to put on uncleanness. He didn't sin, but he bled, he died. He was subject to temptation. So there's your zoomed out version. Let's go back to a body dynamics. It can be very tasking dealing with the cleansing of someone. And sometimes you just need to take a bit of time out after you've gone through something heavy. This is also why Yeshua would say in the garden of Gethsemane, pray lest you fall into trial. Whatever is the unclean being touches is unclean, and the being who touches it is unclean until evening. So let's, these are the, some of the what's, some of the typologies given to us, some of these rituals like, that all point to something greater, which the writer of Hebrews clearly understood, and so did the early assemblies. For when according to Torah, Every command had been spoken by Moshe to all the people. So think Mount Sinai. He took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, hyssop. So these should be very familiar now. These are all ingredients associated with cleansing and purification and that all somehow point to Messiah. He sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which Elohim commanded you. So the writer of Hebrews clearly understood, I believe this is Paul speaking, but clearly understood that water, scarlet, hyssop and sprinkling is now tied to the idea of coming into covenant. So this is where the idea of baptism as being something to come into covenant actually comes from. It goes back to Mount Sinai and these sacrificial offerings. This is the blood of the covenant. Now, what would Yeshua say? This is my blood which has been spilled for the renewed covenant. He was the fulfillment of what Mount Sinai was the type and shadow of. So now these ingredients are linked to cleansing, and coming into covenant. But notice that cleansing and coming into covenant have to be synonymous here. They have to be together. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels of service. Remember when they inaugurated the priesthood and the, and the actual tabernacle? Everything had to be anointed. We are a house. And in a house... There are vessels of honour and dishonour. And according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. I don't, I've done this a million times, but it, forgiveness is a bad translation. The word is aphesis, which means release. Uh, and this links to the jubilee, it links to atonement. So without the shedding of blood, there is no release. Release from sin. I'm going to go as far as saying release from this time domain. Through his blood, we are released from this quarantine. 
So now that we know that water scarlet hyssop is to do with purification and coming into covenant, Ezekiel 36. I shall take you from among the nations and shall gather you out of all the lands and I shall bring you into your own land. This is yet to occur. I shall sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be taher. This is this word. Whenever we kept seeing he needs to be cleansed, he needs to be cleansed, you will be clean, is this word. From all your filthiness and from all your idols, I cleanse you. So this is not speaking Levitically. This is speaking of spiritual adultery. Sprinkling of clean water. If a Hebrew read that, they'd automatically be taken to the cleansing of the leper and to the ashes of the red heifer. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. This is new covenant talk. I shall take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and put my spirit within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. Water, spirit. What John said, I baptise you with water, but he who is coming will baptise you in the spirit. Ezekiel says that's Yah. John the Baptist said that was Yeshua. Oh, wow. This whole baptism thing, we think of it as a transactional event. Oh, I'm baptised. I'm clean in the spirit. I've been washed. I'm new. The prophets seem to imply that that's yet to occur. Do we experience a change? Yes. Look, I'm not trying to downplay, like, from when I was immersed, baptised, whatever you want to call it, there has been a big clean-up in my life. A very big clean-up. But Ezekiel is speaking of a whole house here. A whole house being sprinkled. The house of Israel. We're experiencing a microcosm of this now, I believe. But notice, water, spirit. Clean and unclean. You know, it said if you touched a dead body, uh, not a dead body, um, you know, if you trod on a bug or if you touched a pack of bacon, you know, people freak out about this kind of stuff and they go, I'm unclean. You know, and then they go, well, I can't come to fellowship. and Because they read this. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness. I mean, that's pretty harsh. But when they defile my dwelling place, which is in their midst. All of the clean and unclean Levitical stuff, the Levitical rituals, was to do with, they had the physical tabernacle with the actual presence of Elohim in their midst. And this is what, why the, the clean and unclean rules were so stringent. Here's the thing. It got to a point. One of the prophets, I think it's Ezekiel, says that Elohim's presence was removed. It removed itself from the temple. Was it for clean and unclean? Why did Elohim remove his presence from the temple? Spiritual adultery. They brought idols into the temple courts. So even then, like again, the Torah is a shadow. Physical versus spiritual. The Israelites had to deal with both the physical, they had the physical temple, and had Levitical and physical impurity. They also had to deal with the spiritual. The house of Israel's problem is that they focus too much on the spiritual at the expense, sorry, they focus too much on the physical at the expense of the weightier matter. And this is why Yeshua would say, you know, well, do you strain out a gnat to swallow a camel? You've forgotten the weightier matters of the Torah. Right now, we don't have that physical presence. But we do have, this is why I included the First Peter 2. We are a spiritual house being built up in the spirit. So 
What we have to worry about is spiritual defilement. That's what we do have to deal with. And I'm going to say this, in the millennial reign, there's a mortal seed pool that are going to once again have to deal with the physical, to teach them something. Because boy, they're going to need a shadow picture because life is going to be cushy for them. But people mix the spiritual and the physical and then they get all confused or they, they, they actually f- uh, fall into fear and self-condemnation. And unfortunately, it's to bring... That there's, either you're bringing the blood of Messiah down to that of animals or you're bringing the blood of animals up to the level of Messiah. And I have issues with either one of them. Big issues. Because people freak out like when they hear that there's going to be sacrifices against in the millennial reign. They say, well, it's an attack on Yeshua's blood. No, it's not. Yeshua's blood does what it does. Cleanses you from, we'll get to this, as to the conscience. In fact, let's go there now. Because people really freak out. They think that somehow the blood of animals is antagonistic to the blood of Messiah. Because people see them on the same level. And I actually see them like this. One, the physical points to the weightier matter, which is Messiah. The two can run synonymously and not be antagonistic to each other. Hebrews understood this. But into the second part, the high priest, so the Holy of Holies, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of ignorance of the people. So this is the Yom Kippur ceremony. The set-apart spirit signifying this, that the way into the most set-apart place was not yet made manifest while the first tent has a standing. So while the tabernacle was present, he's essentially saying you can't come, you can't come into Elohim's presence. This has got nothing to do with temples in heaven. and blah, 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 blah. It's about we are in a quarantine. We've been separated from his presence, from being face-to-face which was a parable for the present time. Oh, wait, do you see this? The present time, which means we still can't come face to face with Elohim, in which both gifts and slaughters or sacrifices are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving, but as to his conscience. And this is why we can't mix the blood of animals and Messiah. Only as to food and drinks and different washings and fleshly regulations imposed until a time of setting matters straight. Who allowed creation to become crooked? In fact, let me phrase it this way. Who made creation crooked? It was Elohim. Paul knew this. He says that Elohim subjected the creation to futility. Who can make straight what he has made crooked is the other statement. Creation's still crooked. You're still crooked. I'm still crooked. The time of setting matters straight has not yet come. But Yeshua died. Yes, he did. But it has just... We're limited by time. We're experiencing time. Yah's outside of time. He's paid the price for that to happen, but we have to live it out in time. We're just waiting for the time that matters are set straight, but the price needs to be paid for that setting straight. So I'm not denigrating the blood of Yeshua at all. For the Torah, having a shadow of the good matters to come and not the image itself of the matters, was never able to make perfect perfect those who draw near with the same slaughter offerings which they offer continually year by year. This is the verse that everything in the Torah is a shadow picture. But without, if you're going to throw the Torah out, you're not going to understand the weightier matter to which it points to. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? It's a very good point. 
If the blood of calves and goats really took sin away, you would offer your sacrifice and you'd be magically replenished and rejuvenated and, and you would go and sin no more. But that's not the case. Because those who served, once cleansed, would have had no more consciousness of sins. We're still sinners. But in those offerings is a reminder of sins year by year. That's the purpose of them. To teach you a shadow picture, to point to something that you're going to need a deep clean. Because this isn't cutting it. You know, I was going to save this for when we deal with the inauguration of the priesthood. But I'll make mention of it now because I think it's uh, pertinent People, you see these pictures of priests and Levites in like glowy whites, right? And they're picture perfect, pristine white garments. That would have not been the case. When the priesthoods were inaugurated and priests were brought into service, they were sprinkled with blood and then they were sprinkled with oil on the garments and on them. Now, you try to take a white linen garment with blood and oil on it, and rinse it out with water. Is that stuff coming out? No. Do you see the beautiful picture? You can wash it in that laver all you want. You're not getting the stain out. But then Yah says in Isaiah, come, let's reason together. Your sins will be forgotten and will become white as snow. Think of the kings and priests of Revelation and their white linen garments. The garments are finally clean. It, people miss this. They miss this. It's going to take something very special to clean your garments. It's going to take something very special to clean your soul. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This is what all these things pointed to. And it points to living waters and the blood of a guilt offering. Which Messiah would make himself. Psalm 51, David understood this. Show me favour, O Elohim, according to your loving commitment, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. The word macha, it actually means to stroke or rub, to wipe, which should have priestly overtones. So what, what did the priest do? He rubbed blood on certain places. In fact, this is a, the word atonement, kippur, comes from the word kafar. Now, kafar means to either rub on or to rub off at the very base level. So this word, this is priestly language that David's speaking. It's priestly language. Notice here, to smooth out as if with oil. Well, the oil keeps coming up a lot, right? <laughs> Also to touch, is there a, a, an inference to Nagar here as well? I love how everything's interconnected. Wash me completely from my guilt. The word kavas, which is to tread out the garments. And cleanse me from my sin. The word taher there, again, uh, clean, unclean. But notice David's not saying cleanse me from my Levitical impurity. He already knows how to do that. He's saying, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done evil in your eyes. This is after he's killed Bathsheba's husband, by the way. This is when this psalm was written. That you might be proven right in your words. Be clear when you judge. Notice he's not running away from accountability. He's saying, you're the righteous judge. Just be clear about it. See, I was brought forth in crookedness and in sin my mother conceived me. He understood the minute he was plugged into this time domain, fallen. Even in the womb, he was fallen. 
See, you have desired truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. Cleanse me with hyssop. Priestly language. Hopefully this makes way more sense now. We've gone through the cleansing of the leper, the cleansing of the house, those that were to be cleansed from death with the ashes of the heifer and the living waters. They were sprinkled with hyssop. Cleanse me with hyssop and I am clean. Wash me or tread me, this is the word kavas, to tread, and I am whiter than snow. Oh, but wait, the priestly garments were stained with blood and oil all the time. David knows that this is way deeper. It's not physical. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my crookedness. Again, this is this word to rub, which is priestly. David is using the priestly language to be cleansed at the conscience level. Not at the Levitical level. Create in me a clean heart, O Elohim. The word there is tahor, which comes from this word taher, to be made clean. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cleansing spirit. Again, think of everything we've covered so far. There's cleansing, then comes the spirit. There's the blood of the guilt offering, then comes the oil. Do not cast me away from your face, is the word there, panim. And do not, well actually it would be panecha, but, and do not take your set apart spirit from me. So David knew he had the Ruach of Elohim in him. But, yeah. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance, uphold me noble spirit. Let me teach transgressors your ways so that sinners turn back to you. Deliver me from blood guilt. O Elohim, Elohim of my deliverance, let my tongue sing aloud of your righteousness. Blood guilt. What did Messiah make himself? An offering for guilt. The reason we have, look, we, we are all guilty of blood guilt, by the way. We're all guilty of it in one shape or another, which is why we need a guilt offering. O oh, Yah, open my lips and that my mouth might declare your praise. Now listen, David got it. For you do not desire slaughtering or sacrifices, or I would give it. You do not delight in ascending offering. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit and a heart broken and crushed. O Elohim, these you do not despise. And this is how you know David's not talking Levitical stuff here. He understood that these were a typology. He understood that they were pointing to something far greater. So next time you get worried because you accidentally touched a pack of bacon in Asda, just chill. Chill. It's okay. Mikvah. I made, I made mention of this. People say, oh, I'm getting mikvud, like, like it's a verb, and actually it's not. It's the collection of water. I'll try to get through this. Yah spoke to Moshe, saying to Aharon, take your rod and stretch out your hands over the waters of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water. The word there is mikvah. So the mikveh here is the pool of waters. Leviticus 11, but a fountain or a well, a collection of water is clean. So this is what happened if a carcass is dealing with the carcass impurity here. A collection of water, a mikveh mayim. So here we're clearly seeing that the mikveh is actually the body of water. To really make the point, Genesis 1.10, Elohim called the dry land earth and the mikveh hamayim, he called seas. And Elohim saw that it was good. 
So the seeds, it basically mikvah means collection. It means gathering, assembling of something. In this case, water. But mikvah, something waited or hoped for. There's a double meaning actually. It means confidence. It also means a collection. Therefore, by extension, a pond of water. Of water. A mikvah, a caravan or drove of men and horses. So you can have a mikvah of caravans, a mikvah of droves. Yeah, so again, it's quite a large word semantically. So we do use it completely wrong in the Messianic Hebrew Roots Movement. That's just my technical side getting out. But, so it can mean a collection, but here's the thing. Notice something waited or hoped for, confidence, expectation. We should have the ideas of faith involved. The word mikvah appears in a couple of places. Has a nation changed its mighty ones, which are not mighty ones? But my people have changed my esteem for that which does not profit. Be amazed, O heavens, at this, and be frightened. Be utterly dried up, declares Yah. For my people have done two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, crack cisterns, which do not hold water. So here Yah's calling himself, literally the word for fountain would be makoch, uh, and then you've got living waters, ma'im chaim. So we've seen throughout part one and part two now that a big part of cleansing is living waters. Now Yah is saying he is the source of the living waters. Okay, he's the source of them. In Jeremiah 7, but before I go there, no, I'll save this for unleavened bread, but there's huge things here of rejecting his faith and taking religion. Because this is what Jeremiah's people were guilty of at the time. They'd, they, they were, anyway. <laughs> Stay on the topic, Michael. <laughs> o Yah, the mikveh of Israel. All who forsake you are put to shame. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken Yah, the fountain, or the makor, of living waters. So again, Elohim, Yah, is the fountain of living waters. He's the mikveh of Yisrael, the thing that is hoped for. The reason it can be translated as expectation or that which is hoped for is because the word kava, which is thought to be the root word, means to wait, to look for, to hope, or to expect it also means to collect or to bind together. So this is why you've got collection of waters and this is why you have hope of Israel. The hope of Israel. The mikvah. And I believe there's a beautiful word pun. There's, there's a Hebrew word play going on here. <coughs> because I've shown in Genesis 1 that Yah created the mikvah of the seas and said that it was good. And he's saying, I'm the well, the fountain of living waters, but I'm also the mikvah. He's that which holds the living waters. Do you see the Hebrew word play going on there? Not only do we hope for him, but he holds it. In him, all things hold together, right? John 8, the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the Torah, Moshe commanded us that such a one should be stoned. What then do you say? And this they said, trying him. I don't have time to go into this, but they were catching Yeshua out here, trying to anyway, so that they might accuse him. But Yeshua, bending down, wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now we've just read in Jeremiah, those who forsake Yah will be written in the earth, okay? Those who forsake the fountain of living waters. Yeshua seems to be writing in the ground right after this event. 
But what people miss is what's happened literally just before this event. Right before this event, John 7, on the last day, the great day of the festival, this is the Feast of Tabernacles here. If you read further up in John 7, it tells you they, they're traveling to Jerusalem for tabernacles. Yeshua stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and let him who believes in me drink. As the scripture said, out of his innermost shall flow rivers of living water. So we read in Jeremiah that those who reject the fountain of living waters will be written in the earth. Yeshua is declaring himself as the source of living waters, which by the way is a huge divinity statement right there. But then you go to John 8, right after this event, and the Pharisees are trying to trip him up. And Yeshua and you, you've forsaken me. Therefore, by the way, when he would have written in the ground, I believe he was writing their names and they would have known exactly what he was saying to them. Why do you think they wanted to kill him? When you understand the depth of how he thumbed his nose back at them, it, he was offensive. And this he said concerning the spirit which those believing in him were about to receive for the set-apart spirit was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet esteemed. Yohanan, or John, understood that this was pointing to the Ruach. So, think to be baptised in living waters, to be baptised in the spirit, right? We'll deal with that as part of this series. But all of these things have Tanakh, Roots. What did we read in Ezekiel 36? That we will be sprinkled with clean water and he will put his spirit inside of us. The spirit, even in the Tanakh, the spirit is always linked to water. We have oil that's linked to the spirit as well. Let's finish, yeah, let's finish up with these prophecies. Isaiah 44, but now hear, O Yaakov, my servant, O Yisrael, whom I have chosen. Thus said Yah, who made you and formed you from the womb, who helps you. Do not fear, O Yaakov, my servant, and Yeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I pour water on the thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I pour my spirit on your seed and my blessing on your offspring. So you have Elohim here. You, it's, very, it's a Hebrew um, um, literary device. So you say the same thing twice, but with different language. So you, pouring water on the thirsty is being paralleled to the spirit on uh, the seed, which should take us all the way to Ezekiel 36. I will pour my spirit out and give you hearts of flesh so that I can write my Torah on your heart. And they shall spring up among the grass like willows by streams of water. What did you sure say that out of their innermost will spring up a fountain of living waters? Zechariah 14, it shall be in that day that living waters, go read the context, this is clearly millennial rain talk. They shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea, in summer as well as in winter. Yah shall be sovereign over all the earth, and in that day Yah shall be one, and his name one. So the Tanakh speaks of these things. The fulfillment. He showed me a river of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. He's the mikveh of living waters. He's the source of the living waters. This is why Yeshua said, come to me and drink. He's making a divinity statement. How precious is your loving commitment, O Elohim, and the sons of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Think panim al panim, face to face. They are filled from the fatness of your house. Well, we're not living in his house yet. And you give them to drink from the river of your pleasures. 
This is intimacy language. This is actually, uh, I'm going to say it, slightly sexual overtones in this, if you understand biblical metaphors. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. So now light is being equated to water here as well. Yeshua knew this. Yeshua answered, this is the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. If you knew the gift of Elohim and who it is who says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. When you understand the Tanakh prophecies, Yeshua is saying, I'm God in the flesh. Everyone drinking of this water, the well, shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water I give him shall certainly never thirst, and the water I give him shall become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, water has been equated to the Spirit as well. So hopefully people are starting to see how all these things are... I'm hoping that these passages we've gone through in part one and part two are bringing up passages in the Brit Hadashah that you're like, oh, that's what they meant. That's what Paul was saying. That's what John was saying. That's what Yeshua was saying. But baptism, let me phrase it this way. And I don't mean to be derogatory. We've taken baptism and turned it into this tiny little ritual that is almost meaningless. And when you understand baptism, you'll realise that it spells out the eternal plan of red redemption. The eternal from before time to after time and everything in between. And what we experience as baptism now is merely a typology of what's yet to come in the greater fulfilment. First of all, there will be a house restored for day seven of the, for the millennial reign. And there will be the waters from Jerusalem. That's not even the climax. The climax is exiting time. The true baptism. The true crossing over. Let's stop here, amen.